Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. All right. My name is Bob Meese, um, Sloan MBA class of 2008, uh, here celebrating a 10th reunion. Uh, Julie is my classmate, and I was asked to give a, a brief introduction for her talk here today. Just a little bit about Julie. So Julie is co-founder and chief strategy officer at Kairos. After serving over seven years, is the company's founding chief product officer. She drives the vision and strategy behind Kairos's market-leading patient access products and go-to-market efforts in overseas strategic partnerships and ecosystem development for the company. Julie previously played product leadership roles at Generation Health from inception through acquisition and Gnome, the world's first whole genome sequencing service for private individuals. Julie's passion for search technologies began as an early member of the software engineering team at Indeca Technologies. She studied computer science and pre-medicine at MIT and obtained an MS and MBA from Harvard, MIT, HST, and MIT Sloan. So many degrees. <laughs> She's Pit back every single year <laughs> for <laughs> reunion. And in her copious free time outside of Kairos, Julie is a member of the Massachusetts Technology Leadership Council Board of Trustees, a young global leader with the World Economic Forum, and a mom. So please well, uh, join me in welcoming Julie Yu. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me here today. Um, the icons that you see on the screen here are representative of the fact that when I explain to people that Kairos is a company that creates software for appointment scheduling in healthcare, um, inevitably, the first thing that people say or complain about is, why is it so hard to book an appointment for a doctor, and yet so easy to book a multi-leg, international, complex, multi-carrier flight using just my thumb on a mobile app in 30 seconds? And I always say, well, it's a little bit different in healthcare. There's a lot of um, nuance and, and underlying dynamics that make it a lot more challenging to accomplish that same kind of user experience in the healthcare industry. But Kairos is certainly one of the many companies that is um, seeking to build solutions to make it far more efficient to, uh, to get those appointments booked um, for us as consumers and patients. Um, so just a little bit about Kairos. We were um, founded about eight years ago with the mission of improving the way with which patients get matched to the right doctor. And it's a seemingly simple statement that in real life, I'm sure many of us have personally experienced the challenge uh, behind making that happen. And um, the business problem that we are focused on solving is something that we coined as the patient access paradox. And it's this phenomenon by which we as patients are told to wait weeks, if not months, to get a doctor's appointment. In fact, uh, we are proud here in the city of Boston to be literally the worst city in the entire US when it comes to appointment wait times. The average number of days for a PCP appointment is 45 days here in Boston. And we assume that that's because every slot in the system is booked out solid, that there's no capacity in the system, that doctors can't take me sooner, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one of the best kept secrets in healthcare is that that's absolutely not the case. When you actually start to look at the data behind the scenes, uh, look at the schedules of doctors and what goes used and unused every day, um, it turns out that there is a very significant portion of capacity that goes underutilized every single day uh, in our system. And therefore, you have this fundamental mismatch between patient demand on the one hand, waiting weeks to get an appointment, and provider supply going wasted or unused. Um, and that leads to all sorts of negative business outcomes for uh, large health systems, which are our primary customers. So um, organizations like Partners Healthcare here in Boston or um, Stanford and, and UCSF out in, in the Bay Area, um, they are not able to coordinate the care of their patients because the patients aren't able to get you know, timely access to the services that they need. They are uh, more and more employing physicians, and so literally paying salaries to doctors to work for them full time, but not able to fully leverage those providers uh, for their full expertise and level of service. And therefore, they're actually losing revenue. And at the end of the day, uh, we do believe fundamentally in the mantra of no money, no mission. Even though these organizations are not profit organizations, they absolutely need to uh, build operating models that allow them to be solvent, such that we can all receive the care that we need. Um, and so the first question that you might be asking is why? Why is it so hard? What is actually happening behind the scenes that makes it so challenging to accomplish this, uh, this, this match? Um, there's a few things that we've articulated um, that, that we think are, are contributing to this. So one is just completely unused provider supply. And one of the major reasons that this occurs is the lack of interoperability between scheduling systems in the healthcare space. So uh, when, we, when I think about my customer base, 
every single one of those customers has at least five to 10 different scheduling systems in place across their enterprise. And therefore, if I am a scheduler who is trained on system A, I only have access to the capacity in that system. So if a patient is on the phone trying to book an appointment with me, and I don't have access to the dozens of appointments that are available in systems B, C, and D, then I'm not going to be able to fulfill their, their need. Um, so unutilized uh, slots or empty slots is, is one major contributor to this problem. Um, another major problem, and actually one that's pretty fundamental to uh, the mission behind Kairos, is the notion of misutilization of slots. Um, this is basically the notion that upwards of 25% of referrals in the healthcare space actually end up with the wrong kind of doctor the first time. And this was actually the personal experience of my co-founder, who is a cardiologist by training, where he would receive referrals. Uh, patients would wait you know, eight weeks to see him. Uh, they would show up only to be told that he was not the right kind of cardiologist, that they needed to be re-referred to another colleague, wait another eight weeks, pay another copay, and obviously be at risk for not receiving the services that they need. So misutilization is another major contributor to this. And then overutilization is a third one that actually has become pretty prominent uh, these days in the healthcare space. And what this means is if I have a headache, I may not necessarily need to go see a neurologist right off the, uh, off the bat. Neurologists are much more scarce, much more expensive, um, much more constrained in terms of their capacity than some of the lower acuity type providers, whether it be PCPs, whether it be more generalists. And so I might be okay going to a PCP or even an urgent care clinic, a walk-in clinic, and only being referred to a specialist if I meet certain clinical criteria or if I truly need that from an acuity perspective. And so you see a tremendous amount of the, um, of the space, especially on the specialist side of the industry being sort of quote unquote wasted with patients who otherwise could be seen sooner and at a lower cost with other types of, of care providers. And so all of these are contributing to, again, this fundamental mismatch between patient demand and provider supply and are constraining um, these organizations' ability to, to successfully convert uh, the patient demand that's sitting on their doorstep. Um, the other major factor to consider is, you know, what does it actually mean to match a patient to the right provider? Um, it turns out it's a pretty complex problem. When you think about all of the criteria that we as patients uh, express when we need an appointment on the left-hand side of the screen, whether it be my clinical need, obviously, whether it be my insurance, and whether or not my insurance is actually accepted at a specific practice location for a specific type of visit, that rule set uh, turns out to be pretty complex. Uh, whether it be my preferences, I might prefer to see a male or a female or someone who speaks a certain language uh, at, at an office that's within five miles from my home versus something that requires me to travel out farther. So all of those criteria need to be taken into account on the left side. That needs to be uh, bumped up against all of the criteria on the right-hand side, which is all the provider rules. So physicians obviously are trained in a very specific area of expertise. They will have specific requirements around insurance based on their practice location. They may only take certain patients in certain locations based on things like the availability of certain equipment or the availability of certain care teams to support um, certain types of proce procedures or certain types of visits. And so all of that uh, rule set has to be taken into account as well let alone when you then layer on top of that all of the business logic of the health systems that we work with. So I've got employed doctors, I have affiliate doctors, I may want to treat them differently when I'm routing patients to different places. I have different payer contracts uh, in different clin clinics that might impact the way that I'm able to get reimbursed for certain services. And so when you think about all the possible combinations and permutations of all these characteristics, you need uh, essentially a real-time algorithmic way to make these matches um, in such a way that um, ach achieve those goals. And yet, uh, I like to joke that sometimes my biggest competitor in the market is 3M because they make post-it notes. Many of my customers are literally operating off of paper. They are literally, and I'll show you a picture of this in a second, um, they're using paper binders, they're using spreadsheets, they're using information that's out of date um, and doesn't really get to the level of resolution needed to make these matches. Um, so, so this is uh, some of the complexity um, that these organizations are dealing with. And then uh, one of the final pieces here is, is really just thinking about, you know, to step back, all of the different ways by which we as patients can get appointments in the healthcare system. It turns out it's a multi-channel problem, meaning we can get uh, appointments via the web. Increasingly, more and more appointments are being made available for online scheduling. And yet the majority of appointments today are still booked via the phone. Um, so oftentimes we're interacting with the 800 number on the hospital website, talking to a human being to try to facilitate uh, that matching process. Um, or you might be receiving in-person recommendations for care. If you're at your PCP's office and your PCP says, you know, Julie, one of your labs looks a little funny. I'd love for you to go see a cardiologist, get this checked out. Oftentimes they're actually handing you a piece of paper with a phone number on it and sort of leaving you to your own devices to find your care. 
And all of these entry points are not coordinated. So in the absence of a solution like Kairos, you might be on their website doing research for what kind of care you need, what kind of doctor you want to see, to find you know, the perfect match. Dr. Jones looks like the, the one I want to go see. Then when you call in to try to book an appointment, that call center agent is likely working off of a completely different data set. And they might say, I'm sorry, I don't have Dr. Jones in my database, but what about these other options? Um, and certainly um, in the point of care setting at, at your PCP's office, uh, those for folks are typically working off yet another system. And so um, this lack of coordination between all the kind of the access channels of healthcare um, is, is one of the, the, the things that we have to contend with. Um, overlay on top of this the fact that we as consumers have high expectations. We are all shopping online, booking these flights online, experiencing very convenient types of experiences in, in other parts of our lives. And healthcare, which is perhaps one of the most high stake things, uh, you know, industries that we interact with, is nowhere close to that. Um, when I think about the experience of calling into a, a hospital call center and trying to book an appointment, probably many of you have had this experience recently, um, I compare it less to kayak.com and more to Land's End catalogs back in the 80s where you had a paper catalog, it was static, um, you sent, filled out a form, and even if you were a repeat customer, you had to fill out the same form over and over again every time you submitted a new order. You sent that thing off in the mail, and you got no visibility into what the status of that um, order was. You might have to call the call center, check in on the status. Maybe they call you back. And so there's this you know, whole back and forth between um, you know, when you place that order and, and when that, that package ultimately arrives at your doorstep. Uh, there was a study done by Accenture last year that did secret shopper calls to hospital call centers to just describe what that experience looked like. And it turns out we suck. This industry is terrible. We make people wait. Um, the average call time is uh, nearly three times as long as other industries in terms of best practice. 30% um, of the time that you're on the call is unproductive time. We have a customer who actually recorded um, patient calls um, prior to using our solution and then afterwards. And, and the, the prior um, to sort of a baseline use case, they were literally just putting the, the patient on, on hold, making them wait. And what they were doing was they were calling all the doctor's offices to check whether or not they had availability. And you know, getting back on the line and saying, here are three options. The patient would say, sorry, none of those work, and then put them on hold again, have to call out. So it's, just, it's, it's an extremely inefficient process. And yet, again, we all um, interact with other systems and services outside of healthcare that set the bar very much higher than what it is today. And so um, you know, there, there are reasons for this. You know, I've just talked about all the negative things. And you know, there are legitimate reasons why this has been the case. So first of all, from an IT and technology investment perspective, the healthcare industry is very immature. It is far behind many other industries in terms of just the level of spend level of, of sophistication of infrastructure. Um, this is a chart that shows that you know, we're nearly uh, more than half um, the, the IT spend of other comparable industries in terms of IT and technology. And again, as I alluded to earlier, this is the, the standard operating model of most of the most largest health systems in the country. Right? I, we work with uh, organizations that are tens of billions of dollars in revenue every year, and yet this is, this is still the front door experience for, for the patient. Um, and you know, I, I come back to this, this icon set. So you know, when, when we think about other complex industries where there have been supply demand mismatch problems, you know, really complex rules and, and data and, and sort of multiple systems that need to talk to each other in an interoperable way, um, we oftentimes do look at the travel industry and say, you know, how did that, that industry evolve to uh, the place that it is today? Because certainly back in the 90s, it absolutely was not the case that we were able to do these uh, sort of self-service type models. And um, one of the things that we take inspiration from is when you actually look at the data in the, in the travel industry, it was nearly exactly the same as what you see in the healthcare industry today. The fact that every plane that was flying around the world back in the 90s uh, was flying around nearly half empty. It, it actually wasn't the case that they were able to fill up slots because there was simply no way that you could see cross carrier um, booking inventory um, in one place, the travel agents were putting you on hold, calling different carriers, trying to book multi-leg flights um, in the same way that call center agents in healthcare are doing today. And it was the advent of companies like Sabre, like ITA based here in Boston, Kayak also based here in Boston, that um, ultimately created um, all of the fundamental technology infrastructure, uh, the ability to uh, translate data um, in a cross-carrier way, um, the creation of an entirely new semantic means to understand what a 
appointment book booking inventory looks like and how to represent that in a, in a systematic way and, and have the entire industry buy into that new standard. That was a multi-decade long journey that the travel industry was able to su successfully undergo such that today anyone who, is, who flew here knows that they pack those planes full, right? They're very efficient now at using the capacity in the system. And you know, that's ultimately um, you know, what we're looking to achieve in healthcare. So, so some aspects of why, uh, why, is this, um, why is it hard in healthcare? What is specific to uh, the, the healthcare industry that um, you know, has its own nuances and, and makes this a little bit more challenging? So I mentioned earlier that um, you know, there's a pretty significant portion of referrals that get sent to the wrong type of doctor the first time. Uh, one of the fundamental challenges that we at Kairos are taking on is the creation of a novel nomenclature for determining what kind of doctor is appropriate based on your clinical need. Um, one of the shortcomings of the current way this is done is if you look at the industry standard way that specialists are defined, it's quite limited. So there's something called the American Board of Medical Specialties uh, taxonomy that describes all of the types of, let's say, cardiology that one can be board certified in. That organization today recognizes five types of cardiologists. So you can train and be certified essentially in five different subtypes of, ca of cardiology. When you actually, if you were to go ask any of your uh, physician colleagues and certainly cardiologists, um, describe to me all the different subtypes of cardiologists that you refer to and you know, what, um, uh, kind of under what circumstances you would send a patient to one versus another, it turns out there's over 20 different types of cardiologists. And there is no industry standard today in the absence of what we've built that helps describe those subclassifications, um, let alone creates rules around under what circumstances should a patient get to type one versus type 20. And so this is just a diagram that shows some of the uh, machine learning that we provide, uh, that we conducted um, using things like claims data, um, clinical data, uh, other um, you know, data that was just kind of out there to inform what are the actual types of subspecialties that exist in not just cardiology, but 200 different specialties of medicine. And now we use that as the new standard, essentially, for describing the supply side of the network. And it's not just the specialists, it, or specialties, it's also all of the expressions of clinical need that then need to map to those specialists, right? So I find it um, kind of interesting that if you go to any historic sort of existing hospital website today and go to their find a doctor, so um, you know, the, the sites, the websites that we would use to identify uh, a doctor and get an appointment, they all assume that we as consumers know what specialty we need to go to, right? So if I've got some weird, you know, back pain, how do I know if I need to go to a neurologist versus an orthopod? Or how do I know if I have a headache, whether I need to go to a pulmonologist or a neurologist? Um, and so what one thing that we did was fundamentally turn that paradigm on its head and say, let's just let the patient express what their issue is, and we will do the work of translating you know, that into what kind of doctor you need to see. And so what this shows is um, we actually, the, the way that our product is implemented, it's a search engine. So we have consumers and call center agents and doctors doing searches in our product every day. And and we look at the search logs and we can discern all the different ways by, people, by which people express their clinical need. We're able to map those into synonyms and acronyms and abbreviations and clusters of concepts and then map that, that to um, here are the types of specialists that actually provide those services. And that rule set could change from organization to organization. If you're a highly academic medical center like MGH, you're going to have a very you know, highly specialized and, and highly segmented set of rules that determine which doctor should see the left knee case versus the doctor who should see the right knee case. Whereas if you're out in the community and you're the only orthopedic practice um, in, in this rural area, then obviously your orthopods are going to see everything. And so we're uh, essentially building a platform and an ability to kind of flex um, based on, on the supply side of the network at a granular level that did not exist in the absence of this taxonomy. Um, and that's just the clinical aspect of things. Um, really, I think where a lot of the meaty technical problems exist in this space is on the scheduling side. And um, this is just a depiction of the fact that, um, first and foremost, there is no industry standard representation of appointment inventory in healthcare today. We, are actually, we believe that we're one of the first companies to be creating that at the scale that we are, and essentially taking pockets of appointments from you know, Epic. Epic is one of the major EMR systems, uh, electronic medical record systems in the industry, combining that for the first time with appointment inventory from Cerner, from Allscripts, from Athena Health, from all these different vendors, and not just 
merging the data together, but actually creating a whole new semantic um, definition for how to describe appointments in healthcare. And it's all these criteria that you see here. It does take into account things like clinical rules. If you need an orthopedic appointment, typically you're gonna have a lot of pre-visit requirements. I need to see an x-ray within four weeks, or maybe a series of imaging studies that need to be done in order for the doctor to have a, a proper diagnosis. Um, so all of these rules have to be represented in a systematic way such that you can, again, um, search and, and view all the availability in the system. Um, this, is, um, this is what I have to deal with every day, which is the fact that all these organizations um, and vendors literally represent schedules differently, right? So the, there's a fundamental philosophical difference between how Epic represents its calendars um, versus how Cerner represents its calendars. It differs by instance. Remember that most of these organizations or most of these vendors are on-premise client server systems. They're not cloud-based. And so it's not that you can just kind of make a sweeping change in one and have it propagate to all the different versions. Um, our you know, platform needs to be able to interact with all these legacy systems in different ways depending on what version they're on. Um, and you know, as I don't know if anyone had the benefit of hearing Sheryl Sandberg speak earlier today, but one of the things that she said was it's it's typically not the technical problems that are the hardest, it's the human problems that are the hardest. And that's absolutely the case in our space, which is when you get to the bottom of the screen, there's a lot of cultural constraint around how schedules are managed today. Um, I often liken this to the analogy that I once heard from one of the founders of Travelocity, who described what the hotel industry looked like um, several decades ago when you know, something like a Marriott, like some conglomerate um, hotel chain, uh, was not able to manage at the local level what each of the individual Marriotts were doing. So the Marriott in Cambridge might have had a completely different way of representing their booking online, and they chose you know, whether or not to publish their inventory to Hotels.com versus Travelocity in a different way than the Marriott in downtown New York did. And it was only through a decades-long uh, effort that they were able to kind of standardize the way that that, um, that appointment, uh, the booking inventory was managed such that we as consumers were not confused, right? We have a certain expectation when we're walking into a Starbucks that the level of service we're going to receive at a Starbucks in London is going to be comparable to the one in Beijing. And Marriott um, had that same goal of, of wanting to achieve that consistency. That is what's happening today in healthcare. We're a big part of that revolution. It is truly a revolution of getting a doctor. So Dr. Jones, I keep using Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones um, typically will have uh, someone named Nancy sitting at the front desk who is the gatekeeper to his schedule. And he does not trust anyone but Nancy to book an appointment into his schedule. I actually um, ate my own dog food and one day tried an experiment of opening up my schedule to everyone, not just in my company, but all my customers and anyone externally to just book appointments into my calendar. And let me tell you, it was a disaster. And I have a lot of empathy for why physicians have a uh, desire to control and set rules around um, you know, how those appointments get in. And so at the very, very local level, at the bottom of the screen, um, you have to accommodate those individual uh, preferences. Right? These are human beings whose days are filled with um, appointments that they might not feel are appropriate for them. And a lot of the work that we do is just building that trust at the local level to um, get the buy-in that allows them to open up the schedules in such a way that we as consumers can benefit. So, um, so those are some of the, the nuances. Um, this is a, you know, a, an organization, a typical organization that we work with. And I wish that each customer that we dealt with was as clean as working with like an American Airlines or a United where at least they were all working off of you know, one system. They were all um, wearing the same uniforms and all of that good stuff. Um, you know, Banner Health, multi-state organization. Uh, dozens of different systems that we have to integrate with, thousands of providers, all of whom have their own practices, their own you know, way of, of doing business, millions of patients um, that we have to you know, sort of accommodate, um, and, uh, and dozens of different schedules that we have to integrate with. So, um, so these are some of the complexities that exist. Um, and again, I make it sound very dire, and um, at, the, at the end of the day, however, I'm very optimistic uh, about this space, obviously Kairos is as well. Um, and I'm optimistic because it's actually changing. So we're, we're, we're actually making a tremendous amount of progress with regards to both working with the supply side of this industry, as well as um, significantly improving the experience that you all have as consumers um, in, in terms of navigating this type of space. So I mentioned earlier, this is Kayak, uh, the mobile app for Kayak, and what they provide us in terms of a entirely mobile experience, one-click purchasing, notifications, chatbots, recommendations engine, 24 by seven service. Um, this is a um, kind of a, a quick video of one of our applications that we developed that now allows for that kind of experience replicated in healthcare. We can now tap into the scheduling platforms of 
practices open up certain elements of that to the general public for online scheduling via a mobile device in 30 seconds with your thumb. On the back end, we also have a whole appointment fulfillment logistics system that helps manage the things that don't go well, right? So if you can't book an appointment online, if for whatever reason you don't have the right insurance or the appointment availability isn't there for what you need from a clinical lens, uh, we have a whole management um, sort of mission control type dashboard that's, that allows for asynchronous uh, management of appointments on the back end, again, something that doesn't fundamentally exist um, in, in some of the core infrastructure that's out there. Um, we now have customers, I, I mentioned that user experience earlier where we as patients are given a piece of paper with a phone number on it when we're leaving our PCP's office and left you know, to our own devices to figure out how to kind of complete that referral. Um, we now have programs where uh, you as a, as a patient, when you're leaving, are booked with an actual appointment. You're sitting with an iPad, actually searching through the available providers, getting to know that provider, seeing a video of that provider, reading their bio sketch, reading their philosophy of care, so that you have much more confidence that you're actually getting to that right match. And then finally, um, this is the age of AI and chatbots. And what we actually um, fundamentally found was that about, um, in, in some of our, our call centers that we work with, um, upwards of 30% of the call volume that a human being is spending minutes to serve are things like cancellations of appointments, rescheduling of appointments, things that are just really basic tasks that we believe humans shouldn't have to um, get involved in, that they should be able to automate such that those humans can answer the phone for the patients who truly need that high level concierge care. Um, and so we've developed um, uh, some novel capabilities around automating certain aspects of the appointment booking process so, such that you can actually have a conversation with um, a virtual agent, essentially, and again, allow the call center agents to practice at the top of their license. So again, we are optimistic that, um, that this um, you know, not only can happen, but is happening in real life. Um, that was the consumer experience. Uh, some of the actually really exciting uh, things that we're doing on the back end are um, around the supply side of the network. Uh, one of the analogies that we like to use um, when we talk about our product is Moneyball, where we say, okay, in, in the same way that baseball moved from a world of anecdote where scouts would kind of eyeball players and recruit them based on visually what they saw in the field, um, when you think about uh, healthcare and the way that referrals are done. We have actually surveyed um, PCPs and asked, you know, what is the number one source of information that you use to inform where you send the patient? The number one reason is personal relationships. It's who they know, who they went to medical school with, who they train with, who they trust. And, you know, we said, could we use kind of a sabermetrics type approach to essentially put doctors up to bat for the right patients in a more data-driven way? One of the ways by which we're doing that is literally creating lineups of doctors, right? So we're saying you've got a, a network of a thousand doctors. We want to know what position they play at a very granular level such that when a patient is presented in front of you, we can put the right doctor up to bat. So this is one of the tools that we use to do that. Um, you can see Dr. Kelly here, who's an electrophysiologist, 50 different terms that describe what positions he plays and the rules that determine uh, when he should show up in a certain rotation. And what happens when you can um, assess the data at that level is um, some pretty significant uh, changes to the staffing model of health systems that truly improve access. So this was an example where an organization looked at, first of all, the search logs that were flowing through our system. What are people searching for? What kind of services are patients needing? At what locations? From what zip codes? and bump that up against their supply to identify gaps. Where was I able to serve the patient and get them an appointment? And more importantly, where was I not able to serve the patient? Every pin on this map was a, um, an instance of a patient with seizure-related needs that was not able to book an appointment um, with this particular organization. And what they learned was that those patients were not willing to drive to the downtown location where all of their seizure neurologists were practicing um, and rather wanted to be served where they were. And so what this organization did was look at this very basic analytic and say, we're going to shift our staffing model to actually have one of our neurologists spend um, a day a week out in the community and meet those patients where they are. And lo and behold, that alleviated their access problem. So um, some very, again, simple insights that you can derive from the types of data that are being generated off the platform that significantly improve the experience that we as patients can have on the access side of things. Um, and you know, the final thought that I'll, I'll sort of share here is, you know, I, I mentioned earlier this, this notion of the patient access paradox, this fundamental mismatch between patient de demand and provider supply. Um, this graphic shows that uh, we are actually able to solve that. When we're deployed, um, uh, when, when our software is deployed at scale across a, a healthcare organization, um, we can significantly move the needle on both utilization and reduction in appointment wait times. What this is showing here is across the x-axis of the graph 
is um, every doctor in a given practice. And then the y-axis is uh, different weeks in their calendar. And the uh, red means that those, um, those appointments are not being utilized very well. And green means that they are uh, being utilized uh, well. You can see on the left-hand side that things were just kind of scattered almost randomly, right? So do um, the doctors were not being evenly used across the board, um, nor were their appointments being sort of booked sooner uh, in the calendars. And post uh, the deployment of our solution, we were able to show that not only are we packing calendars sooner, so this is decaying inventory, right? If, if we don't use an appointment and tomorrow comes along, we've wasted it, we can't get it back. And so how can we utilize um, the sooner appointments um, more efficiently while also more evenly distributing demand across that provider set? The quote from the CFO of the large health system that we showed this to um, said, okay, every percent lift that you can show me in this regard translates to $10 million in top line growth for my practice. And so uh, we just basically learned that we were significantly underpricing our solution essentially. But um, this is the kind of impact that essentially makes this a no brainer for um, organizations to invest in. Um, we're very privileged to be working with uh, some of the largest health systems in the country. I think one of the most exciting things has been, you know, a lot of times in these large, massive, um, sort of archaic legacy industries, it's not actually the sort of the brand name organizations who are the first movers. Um, it's typically some of the smaller, more nimble organizations who are willing to take risks. What we're finding is that in today's day and age of healthcare, um, so much change, first of all, from a regulatory um, financial reimbursement landscape perspective, um, as well as just the fundamental business model of healthcare has changed, right? We've moved from this notion of purely fee for service, where people just get paid to do more things, to one of fee for value, where you actually have to demonstrate um, impact and outcome on the patient level um, in order to get reimbursed for your care. Um, and that's completely shifted the way that these organizations think. There's a tremendous amount of urgency right now for these organizations to um, transform the way that they operate. And you can see that in the types of names um, of, of companies that are now really, uh, you know, sort of investing in innovative ways to impact their, their patient access operations. So, um, so those are some of the organizations that we're working with. And I'm just generally extremely uh, bullish and extremely long on this space. I fundamentally believe that we are still in the equivalent of the 1998 of the internet era. Um, there's a, a quote that I heard from uh, Mark Andreessen who said back in 97 when Netscape went public, the entire market cap of the internet industry was something like $50 million, right? So we had no idea, we had no, there was no infrastructure. Um, we just, we fundamentally had no idea how big that, that space was gonna be. And I think we're in that, that era right now in digital health. Um, there is just so much fundamental infrastructure that has yet to be built in this space and we're working on some aspects of that but I didn't even touch upon things like clinical document um, exchange and the fact that we still can't get access to our own medical records in a digital form and transfer it from not just one hospital to another but like a practice who works in the same building as another practice. Um, there's some really really fundamental um, challenges out there that there are many great companies working on and you know we hope to do our, our small part to contribute to that. Um, our goal, our vision as a company, you know, kind of where I want to be in 10 years is not just doing what I described. So today we, fun we, we uh, kind of solely focus on um, the ambulatory outpatient market and uh, really around physician office visits, um, kind of the most basic type of care. But think about every possible encounter that you might have with the health system, whether it be through the inpatient, whether if you get admitted for a procedure, if you're ending up in the ED, if you walk into a minute clinic, if you are doing a televisit via your mobile device, if you're getting home care, et cetera, all of these different encounters are things that we have a vision around managing the matching and appointment scheduling process for, because again, today they are all fundamentally fragmented and um, handled in, in distinct ways. And then similarly on the front end, on the top of the screen here, all the ways by which you would enter the health system, um, ensuring that that frontline person who is serving you is not working in a silo, but actually coordinated across whatever enterprise they represent um, to ensure that you're getting the best possible information to make the best possible decision about how to get the care that you need. Um, I will end with a story, which is one of, I'm sure if people have recognized the Shah of Iran. And I don't know if anyone's read here the highly dramatic story of his healthcare experience and journey towards the end of his life. Um, the short story, and this is actually, we actually give a book out to all of our employees when they join Kairos to um, kind of illustrate just the, the opportunity as well as the, the high stakes nature of what it is that we're doing. Um, so the Shah of Iran uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And um, because of his position of power and uh, his access to resources, he called upon the world to send the best doctors to help him take care of his needs. 
And um, it turned out that uh, he had lymphoma, a certain type of lymphoma, that caused a, um, a spleen infection, and he needed to get his spleen removed. And so they called on the US, obviously, which was an ally at the time. And um, the US said, we're going to send our best surgeon, Dr. Michael DeBakey. He had received the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was known as um, one of the most prominent uh, surgeons in the US. And he flew to Egypt, um, sort of a politically neutral zone, to go see uh, the Shah and actually um, treat him for his care. And lo and behold, it turned out that Dr. DeBakey was actually a cardiac surgeon, not uh, an abdominal surgeon. And you know, even though he had trained, obviously, in general surgery, he hadn't done um, any kind of abdominal procedure for 30 plus years um, since his training. And what he hadn't recognized, he was actually quite adept at the procedure itself, but what he hadn't recognized was that the guidelines had changed. In splenectomies, um, the guidelines had been updated since he had trained to basically require that uh, you put a drainage tube in the patient just in case you nicked the pancreas. And that was because uh, the pancreas would exude bile and essentially the patient would get infected and it was a pretty common um, you know, sort of error that occurred during the surgery. And so he didn't know that, he did the surgery, it was successful, but lo and behold he did nick the pancreas and ultimately, in a highly dramatic fashion, that was actually what led to the Shah's death. And so this is, a, again, a very dramatic way of saying that um, it's not just about who the best doctor is. It really is about the right doctor. Hopefully, I was able to illustrate a little bit of today uh, why that is so complex and, and, and some of the nuance sort of behind the scenes that leads uh, to that being a significant challenge and some of the work that companies like Kairos are doing to, um, to try to solve that need such that you know, we as patients can get uh, the care that we need the first time around and not have to wait and be re-referred um, like we oftentimes are today that providers in the system can be leveraged for their unique expertise um, and uh, sort of able to practice at the top of their license, so to speak, and that the healthcare organizations that are struggling today to uh, remain solvent and remain relevant and actually um, be in a position to, to deliver the care that we all need can actually operate uh, far more efficiently than they are today. So thank you. Um, that's all I wanted to share today. I think we do have some time for Q&A if folks um, have any questions or want to learn more about the space. I was a little amused at um, when you said hospitals weren't fully uh, leveraging their physician resources because I was reminded of a story that uh, spent a fair bit of time in the Boston Globe uh, a couple of years ago mm -hmm. where one of the senior members of their uh, orthopedic surgery practice group uh, was at odds with the hospital management because they continued insisting that he do um, multiple simultaneous procedures and uh, he refused, it led to his quitting, um, got a lot of publicity. So uh, what it provokes in my mind relative to your presentation um, is the whole issue of uh, physician pushback. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the one doctor who had a preference for somebody uh, doing his appointments for reasons where he understood how important it was for th that last stage of the s selection process to be uh, effective. But the whole concept of physician pushback was one that I was wondering about. And then the other point was um, your 10-year plan. And you didn't mention emergency rooms. And again, from a little bit of personal experience, um, I, I, I happen to get my medical care from a hospital that probably has the uh, best um, uh, specialist practices in the country. Um, truly amazing. And I once had the opportunity, unfortunately, to use the emergency room. And it was a learning experience for me. It could be a learning experience for you. And uh, applying your skills to that problem area would be, uh, I think, very valuable for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for those questions. So the first question about Dr. Pushback, absolutely um, something that needs to be overcome, just like many other industries that have gone through sort of transformation and standardization type of initiatives. Um, I'll say the one thing that we try to emphasize is at the end of the day, yes, implementing a system like what, what Kairos provides does require the relinquishment of some control, right? At the end of the day, you will have to open up schedules, um, you know, kind of codify them in such a way that other people, that benefits other people, not you know, yourself. And so that's a fundamental trade-off that will have to be made in um, sort of exchange for what we think is actually the, the true benefit to the physician, which is we're going to guarantee that you only get the types of cases that are going to allow you to 
leverage your expertise in the way that you've been trained to do for the last 10 years. And that's been a huge um, you know, value proposition of ours when we approach physicians directly, which not a lot of vendors do, frankly. Um, I think a lot of people are scared to engage in that kind of conversation directly with physicians. But we have an entire clinical services team that goes in with that message that says, if you adopt the system, yes, we're going to have to standardize some aspects of your schedule, but um, we are you know, geared towards um, giving you high quality referrals and essentially allowing you to practice, practice at the top of your license. So that's kind of the messaging that we use there. Um, emergency rooms are absolutely squarely in our, in our target zone. So they were on that slide. I just didn't say them out loud. But um, we recognize both um, the challenge of getting in and also when you're leaving the ED, ensuring that you get the follow-up care that you need. So that is a, um, a target use case that uh, many of our clients are implementing. Yep. Yep. Hey, Julie, Jeff. hey. Nice job in your presentation. Thank you. We are proud of all you're, uh, you're doing. <laughs> Why, thank you, Jeff. Um, <laughs> thanks for representing. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about kind of highs and lows for you personally at Kairos the last eight years? Oh, yeah. I actually have a, a different talk that I sometimes do that shows like the Gartner like hype cycle, trough of disillusionment, and all that good stuff. So, um, like I always, I always say that any entrepreneur who, when you see them over and over and over again, they're always like, "I'm crushing it, I'm crushing it." They're lying. Um, it is has been <laughs> major ups and downs, especially I would say in healthcare. Um, there's a famous VC who oftentimes will say, "There's no such thing as hyper growth in digital health," and I think a lot of it is because our industry is so immature and they're just you know, so many fundamental laws of physics that apply maybe elsewhere, but not in our space. Um, and we, you know, we raised $70 million in venture capital. And part of the reason that we had to do that was we had to live long enough to educate the market on a solution space that they never even thought about or knew, you know, was necessary. And, and also build the technology infrastructure that we hoped was there. You know, on, honestly, when I, when I started Kairos, I was like, oh, there has to be some interoperable scheduling you know, solution out there that can just bring me all the calendars. And of course, that doesn't exist. And so we had to build a lot of the things that we would otherwise hope were commoditized. Um, and so it definitely has been a long journey, lots of ups and downs. We pivoted the company you know, early on. And so that was um, you know, one of the major aspects of our journey. And uh, we are, you know, knock on wood, right now in a pretty um, nice growth period um, that you know has started to show signs of paying off. But um, if you're coming to drinks tonight, I will be happy to share more <laughs> over a few glasses of liquor on that one. <laughs> um, yes. I, you alluded to this earlier, but there's this reality that in healthcare, um, also in some other industries, there's these investment in big systems, and it's complex to change out. And there's a high cost, not just financial, but also training and otherwise. Yeah. So. Um, is there anything you can share in terms of themes on the general approach when you're working in a context like that? Yeah. How do you partner? How do you sell? Or like, w what is the approach to try to expedite that? Yeah, so we, um, I would say two fundamental decisions that we made that ended up allowing us to get traction. One was we decided to literally sell to the top of the market first. And there's actually, when I look at my competitors, a lot of them actually started on the low end of the market because the sales cycles are like 100 times shorter, a lot less complex, a lot less bureaucracy, et cetera. But we felt that in order for our platform to have the impact that we believe it can have, you needed to sell at scale. And so that was another reason why we raised so much venture capital was that we needed to survive those sales cycles um, to be able to do that. Um, so that's one thing that, again, takes a long time, multiple years, to uh, get product market fit when you're trying to go that route. But um, you know, that has to be a deliberate decision that you make. The other um, thing, and it, it, this might sound a little bit contradictory uh, relative to what I was saying about physician um, engagement, but when we first designed our product, uh, one of my fundamental principles as the head of product was we cannot build a product that relies on a doctor using it. We have to build something that you can deploy at scale without a single doctor literally using our software. And so um, that actually, in, uh, anyone who's familiar with what has been occurring with electronic medical record deployments and implementations and physician burnout, it's a really serious issue and significant issue right now. And the notion of putting yet another thing on someone's mobile app or, or desktop was just untenable. And so um, that was another principle that I've seen. There's a graveyard of companies that their business model or their thesis on their product was, and then the doctor will log into the mobile device and do X, Y, Z. And it's just, you know, that's a really, really hard value proposition right now. So. So um, those were two decisions that we made early on that allowed us to kind of get the traction that we needed. Antonio, hi. How Good, how are you? Great. Um, so uh, the channel, uh, chan the, the main channel through which you started, uh, you know, um, I guess, you know, making revenue or, or selling your, you know, the product, mm -hmm. you know, where did you start? And what, what was the entry point? We sold, so part of what, um, 
what kind of decision making we made at, did at the early phases of this. So if I go back, we, we said, where is the one place that we could sell to that would have the most uh, volume, transaction volume, such that we can prove ROI and then scale from there? And the call center, um, I mentioned earlier, was the most unsexy place to sell into, right? I mean, it's uh, literally a cost center. It's you know hundreds of high school trained individuals who churn every three months because their job is just so terrible. And um, you know that, but that was the the place where health systems were receiving the most calls and requests for appointments, and and the place where those things were falling down the most that they were not able to convert that demand. And so, and they didn't have any budgets, right? Like there was no budget for something like this. And so um, that said, we still chose to kind of focus on that area because to us in the first few years, it was more important to get scale and deployment and demonstrate ROI such that we could then figure out who's gonna pay the bigger check than try to get that big check up front. So we started with call center, like literally the first buyer of my solution was a director of call center at um, a hospital in Cleveland. And um, we spent the entire first year of our business just working with that company to get the product right, get the implementation right, get the physician engagement strategy right, get the business model right, and only after that first year where we were able to prove, and that $10 million number that I showed was from that organization where they said, I'm willing to pay $10 million for this because it moved the needle that much. Um, and then everything kind of flowed from there. So we were very patient at the beginning, and I wouldn't say we started in a place that ended up being the ultimate buyer. Today, our buyer is a CFO. Um, so, but we were able to make that, um, that journey based on those initial proof points. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have. Let's oh, thank cool. Julie again. Thank you, everyone. Time. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks.